Hi, I'm Major Adam Carr, and I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about translation and war. And I'm going to try to convince you to think about translation and war, and particularly how we employ our TERPs in terms otherwise than a function of accuracy or instrumentality, and rather as a process by, we, by which we receive or achieve a shared understanding with our target audience, and then perhaps more importantly, our interpreters. So I'm going to start with a quick made-up combat hypothetical. So imagine November 2004, Fallujah, Iraq. It's the second battle of Fallujah. Marines are fighting block to block. And one fire team of Marines prepares to clear a home that's suspected of being a staging point for insurgent attacks. They enter violently. The lead Marine kicks in the door. The three others follow. They clear the foyer. They enter the living room. In the, in the living room, they encounter a very scared, unarmed man. The team leader points his rifle at the man. He crouches up against the wall, and he asks through his terp, is there anybody else in the home? And do they have any weapons? Right behind the closed door to the next room is the man's 16-year-old son. He's about to enter to see what's going on. When he opens that door, a young Marine will point their rifle and make a split-second split shoot or no-shoot decision. That decision will be based in large part on the answers to that team leader's questions, which of course relies entirely on the interpreter. Now, I offer that hypothetical because it's emblematic of the way that we as military officers often think about translation and terps in war. They're like an enabler. They're similar to the hand mics on our radios. We input the message, it travels through a secure frequency, and then comes out of another hand mic. We don't question the authenticity of the message we receive through the hand mic. We don't understand Arabic any more than we understand the secure frequencies that supposedly carried the message through our hand mic, right? And that's not to say, it's all generally transparent to us, and that's not to say that we're naive. We often catch interpreters maliciously manipulating language, but even when we catch them, we think about it in one of two ways. Either one, it's a capability loss. The interpreter's not good enough at English or the host nation language, and so they're incapable of performing their combat function, their enabler function. Or two, we think of it in terms of loyalty, that they're deliberately um, manipulating the language uh, to some end. It's important to note, and I'll get to this by the end, that we rarely evaluate ourselves as the originator of the message when considering why it came out on the other end of that transmission so, uh, so poorly. Now, in terms of my combat hypothetical, thinking about a translator in this very instrumental way is absolutely fine. It's a rapid exchange of discrete information, and you're looking for a binary response, right? You're looking for yes or no. And uh, language geeks like me can have a, a lot of fun nitpicking the way the translator could even take that apart, right? He might not say weapon, he might say rifle, he might say gun, he might say, you know, anything else, Kalashnikov. He might not say, is there anybody in the house? He might say, are there any men in the house? Because he's been culturally raised not to directly reference women in the home. But those are all benign variances, right? The, the Marines are going to get the information that they need to make the right decision when they need to make that decision. But your interactions in Iraq and Afghanistan will rarely be that clean, rarely be that rapid, rarely be that clear. You're going to be talking to local political officials, local security officials, village elders, tribal elder, elders, merchants, contractors, you name it. And those exchanges are going to resemble political negotiations much more than they resemble rapid exchanges of information under direct fire or uh, in combat circumstances. And then those minor variances that, you know, geeks like me might talk about in translation become very, very severe in terms of their implications. And so I want to move on and talk about what happens in those instances. So I want to back up and talk about what exactly is language. So this, uh, this scholar, Lawrence Venuti, he calls it a, quote, chain of signifiers. Now, it's signifiers because words represent always imperfectly some concept, idea, or thing. And it's a chain because we put them in a sequence. Those of you who have been uh, through the rigor of our English department understand what happens when you disrupt that sequence, right? You get red ink. Ultimately, you break the message if you break the chain. He then goes on to discuss signifiers and the relativity of them. He uses a lot of very big words to describe this, but ultimately, it comes down to the idea that what you perceive when you hear a specific word or concept is based on a very complex confluence of factors. It has to do with your upbringing, it has to do with your experiences, your environment, your target audience, the person who's telling it to you in the first place. And like, uh, you know, like beautiful snowflakes, the way that every single person interprets each signifier is individual to that person. 
Now what happens culturally, and he defines this as shared values, beliefs, and experiences, is you develop a shared understanding of those signifiers within a small group. So cultures, through their shared values, beliefs, and experiences, will start to identify the same, or it will become homogenous, their interpretation of these signifiers. You guys actually experience this all the time here at West Point. You have developed your own little sub-language group that you're all very familiar with, even if you don't think about it, right? So if I said, or if somebody in here said right now, I have hours this weekend, you all know exactly what that means. And not only do you know what it means literally, but you're able to empathize with the person because you understand all the figurative implications of that term, right? It's regret for having done what you did, hopefully. Maybe frustration for having lost your weekend. There's, there's a whole series of interactions assumed in that term. And in that one word, you have a shared understanding of that uh, complex concept. But when you call your friend from your hometown or um, at another college and say, I can't take pass this weekend, I have hours, well, you're going to get a pretty confused response. You're going to get, you have hours to do what, right? They don't understand what you're talking about, and you'll probably get what's pass, too, as one student uh, recently brought up uh, to me. Now, this is kind of a funny example of the relativity of language, but obviously you can start to intuit how in more severe circumstances this becomes a lot more important and has very significant implications. The, the easy example to always bring up is the word democracy, right? If you say democracy here at West Point or you say it in most places in the United States, it's not like we think about democracy as the dictionary definition or in sort of the Greco-Roman tradition of where we think about it in terms of our own lives and what democracy means to us, and it can connote something very specific. But I would posit if you say the word democracy in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or Libya or the Ukraine, you're going to get a very different response, right? Uh, at best, you're going to get maybe an association with corrupt oligarchies. And then, you know, at worst, you get, well, democracy to me means you come in here with tanks and drive down my street and rip down the, uh, you know, the, the wires for our electricity and then start blowing out people. That, that's my last. Last time somebody brought me democracy, that's what, that's what I experienced. And so the connotation is different. And you can understand if you're a patrol leader uh, idealistically engaging a population and your main messaging theme is I'm here to bring you democracy, you might not be saying what you think you're saying. You might lack that shared understanding um, with your audience. So with that more complex understanding of language, I'm going to turn to an excerpt from another novel that uh, demonstrates this uh, a bit better. The novel is Fives and Twenty Fives by author Michael Petra, and it follows a marine platoon through Iraq, the Sunni Triangle, and the particularly tumultuous like 2005 to 2007 years. And in this scene, the platoon has just stopped at a dilapidated farmhouse along a dangerous highway, and they're investigating it, essentially. They've never been there before. So the scene's told from the perspective of um, of one of the people there named Kateb who actually speaks English unbeknownst to the patrol and the interpreter there, and that's whose voice we're hearing. And, and in this case, I've expurgated um, the obscenities in the text because it doesn't contribute, but um, if something sounds off, it might be because I've changed a couple of words. Finished with their search, they sat them down on the log next to us and called for their officer on the radio. The officer, a black man with arm muscles that showed through his uniform, approached with an interpreter at his side. The fat interpreter, a Kuwaiti, judging by his accent and his expensive watch, smirked at us. Good morning, I'm Lieutenant Peterson, the officer said. Now look, sorry we have to search you like this. The anti-Iraqi forces, the bad guys, they make it necessary. Need to ask you a few questions, though. Need to ask you what you're doing here, who are you, all that stuff. He points to his interpreter. And in Arabic, the interpreter says, this guy, Peterson, he's going to screw your whole world. Tell him where you have the weapons hidden. He's 50 Cent's cousin. I'm not lying. Peterson continues in English. Now, do you have any weapons here? Any rifles, an RPG? It's fine if you have a rifle. One Kalashnikov per household. He points to the Kuwaiti, who again speaks in Arabic for him. You Takfiri know about Abu Ghraib? This will be worse. Tell Peterson where you keep the rockets or we will put you all in a naked pyramid right over there. Take pictures for the internet all over MySpace tomorrow. Remember, this is 2005, MySpace. So I want to talk about Lieutenant Peterson's seemingly innocuous phrase, all that stuff. He doesn't actually want the translator to literally translate all that stuff. To him, it functions as an et cetera. It stands in for a routine series of questions when a patrol investigates a new site. Questions like, who are you? What are you doing here? What are you selling? Have you seen anybody suspicious? Do you have any weapons or contraband? Has anybody asked you anything recently? He and his soldiers have a shared understanding of what those quest questions represent, but unbeknownst to him, his interpreter either does not, best case, or worst case, is, of course, lying to him. 
Now, that one very simple phrase actually belies a very complex chain of signifiers. See, Peterson's senior unit, or several levels up, has the mission of creating stable democratic institutions in Iraq. And so the unit below them determines to that end that they need to reduce the violence to an extent that the citizens can engage reasonably with their government without fear of retribution. That eventually, that chain of mission statements eventually makes it down to Peterson and his job is to kill or expel malicious actors. And to that end, he's going to start to try to chart their travel patterns, identify their bed down points, etc. And now all that chain is wrapped up in this phrase, all that stuff. His soldiers all know that. Uh, the interpreter likely does not. And more than just the chain of signifiers, that phrase actually is predicated on a lot of cultural assumptions Peterson has about his mission. Assumptions we all understand, such as the universal applicability of Western-style democracy, the universal appeal of free market capitalism, certain philosophical presumptions about the relationship of citizens to their government. Um, Peterson doesn't likely say those things all the time, but he absolutely operates under the assumption that if he can reduce the violence in his area of operations enough, that the citizens will naturally gravitate towards those values. And that's all wrapped up in his initial questions to create, uh, create cooperation. Now, when he says all that stuff, he's asking his interpreter by name's sake to interpret it, and that's exactly what the interpreter did. See, it seems in that little vignette that the interpreter is just like, you know, a malicious, a flat malicious actor, a spoiled adolescent taking advantage of helpless people with a marine platoon behind him as muscle, essentially, but Peterson asked him to interpret, and, and that's exactly what he did. The, to us, it seems like what Peterson is doing is clear. He's trying to create cooperation and establish a relationship. He knows that there's a lot of risk for the people that he's talking to in doing that. He knows that they know that they could face retribution from violent actors, sectarian groups within the area if they cooperate with him. He's trying to convince them that it's in their best interest to do so, that he can protect them, that, uh, that he has confidence in them and they should as well, and that they should take that risk for the betterment of their country in the long term. Um, it's a difficult proposition, but to us that seems like a fairly clear proposition. But to a Kuwaiti or Iraqi national, who has lived their entire life under the specter of violence, whether it be from oppressive dictators or from American invasions or from the sectarian violence they're experiencing, that proposition is not so clear. They're not on the same page as Lieutenant Peterson and certainly uh, not his interpreter. So what the interpreter has done is take Peterson's message and conform it to the, to the, to the shared understanding that he thinks he can achieve with his audience. And that understanding is, of course, a threat. And he's not wrong to assume that these people on a, in a dilapidated farmhouse on the side of a dangerous highway in the Sunni Triangle of Iraq in 2006 don't exactly have a frame of reference for what it means to create stable, lasting democratic institutions and have no concept of what Peterson's counterinsurgency strategy is. So instead of trying to engage concepts that he knows or assumes his audience will not understand, he has resorted to something more intelligible to the audience. And he can be fairly sure that his audience knows about Abu Ghraib and what happened there. He can also be fairly sure that they know who Fiddy Cent is and that they can relate to that representation of American culture and, uh, and power. And so he's conformed the understanding Peterson had of what he was trying to communicate to the understanding he expects that his audience will be able to communicate. Now, I'm not trying to apologize for the interpreter. Another scholar, David Damrosch, said amidst all the abstraction and relativity associated with language, there is such thing as just a good and a bad translation. And uh, this fat Kuwaiti, his translation, I, I would characterize as bad. But rather, I want you to think about this process of translation, again, not in terms of accuracy or its functionality, but this process of creating a shared understanding and then understanding the cultural and linguistic forces that operate at the site of translation. See, Peterson was trying to communicate something profound behind all that. It's about trust and cooperation in a very complex environment. And with that in mind, an accurate translation might not have been an effective translation, right? I mean, he doesn't actually want, an accurate translation would mean you literally translate the phrase, all that stuff, and that's not at all what Peterson is trying to say. 
So when we consider what makes a good or a bad translation or what it means to achieve uh, shared understanding, it's obviously important that we understand what the cultural and linguistic forces are that ultimately form what it is that our understanding is. And there's a couple of practical benefits and then there's a couple of um, either abstract benefits. Practical ones are, of course, don't use idioms. Don't say things like all that stuff to a translator that's not on the same page as you. And hopefully you'll learn that lesson over and over from smart officers as you get trained. Also, question your own message and look at the audience for the reaction. If you're communicating trust and what you get in response is fear, then it might be time to revisit this idea of shared understanding. And then the last thing I would tell you is challenge the assumptions that are inherent that maybe you haven't thought about in a while in your language and you might notice that the audience doesn't share those assumptions. And so I'd leave you with a hypothetical though. If in that dilapidated farmhouse they were harboring weapons specifically for an insurgent group, but once the Kuwaiti, the fat Kuwaiti threatened to put them in a naked pyramid, and posted on the internet, they were like, I'm giving up those weapons. Did that just become a great translation? If you have an answer to that, please let me know. I've been laboring over it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.